Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Stan Lozinski and I'm a certified financial planner and registered fiduciary. Uh, we are going to be talking today about estate planning basics and I am going to share my screen with you uh, as we start to get into this topic. Um, you know, estate planning is probably an area that a lot of people feel challenged on and you really should not uh, realize. A proper plan really assists an individual in planning for either the event of incapacity or a death within the family and so on. And it's not a one size fit, fits all scenario, but it's not as complicated as a lot of people may want to believe it is. So uh, I'm going to be touching on a lot of the basic concepts of this and ultimately what an estate plan really provides to you as an individual. Now, our next slide here, basically, again, what is an estate plan? It's a map, um, basically reflects what you want your personal and financial affairs to, have to be handled in the event of incapacity and death. Uh, a very simple statistic that we utilize for this purpose is that someone is more likely to become disabled than to pass away. Matter of fact, the, the ratio is about 16 times more likely to become disabled versus death. So when you start to think about uh, the planning that's required, it's not just a will for your final for the final disposition of your assets. It really comes down to you know planning for those final years or even earlier in life if God forbid something happens. So it's very important to keep these concepts in mind. And again, we're going to touch on some of these items right now. Um, who needs one? It's not just for the wealthy, as I was mentioning a few minutes ago. Um, with an estate plan, you really can't control what happens to your property. And if you know something happens, again, you, you will not have your wishes really clearly communicated to the beneficiaries of the family or those individuals that are going to be helping administer your estate while you're incapacitated or disabled and so on. Um, a proper estate plan can also help provide for the future needs of your loved ones. So, you know, we're going to talk about this, but, you know, you need this, especially if your spouse is not comfortable with handling financial matters. Uh, you have minor children. Obviously, if something happened to you and your spouse, you don't want your young children to inherit a large sum of money. How that would be administered and managed for their benefit is really a question. And then we start to talk about, again, uh, at the larger level for estate planning, you know, the federal government allows for an exemption currently of about $11,700,000 for an estate against the federal estate taxes. So again, understanding the structure of your estate, the valuations and so on are extremely important. And also if you own property in more than one state, you know, a lot of people may live up in the Northeast here, uh, New York, for example, but also may have a vacation home in Florida. Again, planning for those situations is important. And again, uh, privacy, um, you know, when someone does pass away, uh, if you pass away without a will or even with a will, the estate goes through a probate process, and this is a public process. So understanding that is important. And lastly, if you own a business, uh, if you own a business, there should be some succession plan in place. Uh, is there a partner involved with the business? Is there uh, children or a key employee that might be able to step up and take over the business? Again, Planning for these uh, contingencies is extremely important. It's when you don't leave instructions behind, then it gets very complicated and burdensome for the individuals that are trying to manage around these things. So the concepts we're gonna be talking about today uh, initially are going to be planning for incapacity or disability. We're gonna be talking about healthcare, uh, property management, planning for death, uh, discussion on wills and probate, uh, some of the basics on taxes. Uh, this is probably one of the bigger concerns for individuals that are looking to transfer assets within a family. And, you know, again, talking about opportunities for gifting while they are alive is important. But then we also have the opportunity with certain products like life insurance to create 
liquidity within an estate. So again, some very important ideas there. And again, the utilization of trust type instruments that again, can organize and manage the process of transferring assets or in general, just maintaining them for the benefit of uh, the individual that granted those assets into a trust. So let's talk about this a little bit. Now, planning for incapacity. Um, this can strike any time. Uh, I had recently a client that had a bad car accident about two years ago. Uh, 50 years old, they broke uh, several vertebrae in their back and also a leg. So they were laid up for a good six months going through rehab surgeries and so on before they were able really to start to you know, be functional again and potentially start getting back to work and things like that. So again, disability can strike at any time. It's not just when you're older uh, and maybe getting on in years and diminishing in your capacities, whether it be cognitive or physical, it can strike someone at, at very young ages. I knew some, uh, an individual that started to have the onset of Parkinson's at age 42. So again, these are some of the issues that really can strike at any time. So it's important to start planning for this, not waiting for some future event or time when you think you're going to be needing it. So it's, it's usually happening when you're not anticipating it. So just keep that in mind. Um, if you don't plan, what happens is if you don't have any family members or something like that that want to step up to handle your affairs, the courts can appoint a guardian. And, you know, unfortunately that, you know, without a plan, the burden on the guardian becomes quite extreme because they're making decisions that maybe won't be in line with what you wanted. And again, they are st stepping in here, trying to organize your affairs and have an understanding of how best to deal with the assets and maintaining them for your benefit long-term. There also may be some costs associated with a guardian. So we can talk a bit about that uh, also at some point. But let's talk about some of the uh, you know, planning for incapacity and again, healthcare direct directives that would be necessary as part of an overall estate plan. Now, the first one is a living will. Uh, this is very popular because this, this generally just puts all of your wishes in writing. Uh, when you have things in writing, it's hard for someone to argue against that. And the courts really look at this uh, as really your instructions on how to maintain your assets while you're incapacitated. And this could be, you know, again, uh, discussing how, what kind of care you want uh, is, you know, if you're on life support, uh, is, it is it heroic means, uh, if it is something that's terminal or not. You know, so again, having these instructions in place that you are, are basically communicating your wishes is extremely important. Uh, a healthcare proxy. This is probably one of the, the major items that is necessary, particularly if you are incapacitated, you're not able to communicate or make decisions. So a healthcare proxy basically is like a power of attorney that you're providing to an individual that can step in to make decisions on your behalf. Um, this is probably in conjunction with the living will, some of the most important two documents that you can have while you're alive. So again, someone can make decisions for you based on your wishes with the healthcare uh, living will and the healthcare proxy again, gives them that authority. So just understanding that is extremely important. And then we have the documents like a DNR or do not resuscitate order. Uh, these are final directives. You know, uh, do you want heroic means, mechanical support to keep you alive, things along those lines. In a lot of states, depending on uh, what jurisdiction you're in, the DNR document would sometimes be included with the living will. Again, most hospitals and medical professionals will honor these directives, whether they are separate documents or combined. Uh, and there usually is, uh, you know, a re reciprocity as far as them honoring those documents from other states. So if like, for example, you live in New York and you did all of your estate planning in New York, but you ultimately moved down to Florida, just use that as an example again, all of these documents would still be valid and again, carry forward with you. 
Now let's talk about property management tools. Um, again, assuming that you are disabled, what happens to assets? Joint ownership is probably the easiest one to establish that you can essentially give control of an asset to another individual. Now, this is typically used between a spouse or with children. Um, again, giving them the ability, if you're incapacitated, to manage the household affairs or those assets that are held jointly. Uh, could be bank accounts, could be a home. Again, it, it could fall into any category. Uh, if that uh, you want to go beyond that and have someone actually be able to act on your behalf, you can get what's called the power of attorney, uh, durable power. Basically, someone can go into a bank, manage your affairs, pay your bills, things along those lines. I recently had this situation with my cousin who had a stroke a few years back and I was her power of attorney. So I was able to communicate with the banks and uh, the state regarding her property and all the utilities and so on to manage her affairs and pay her bills while she was incapacitated and going through rehab and so on. So very important to have a power of attorney document in place, in addition to if you want to consider the joint ownership options and so on. And lastly, we have a living trust. Now, this is something that uh, generally you would create while you're alive and you would transfer assets into this trust. You still maintain control. The assets are still titled underneath your social security number and so on in most cases. Uh, but again, it provides for the administration and management of your assets while you're incapacitated. So very important to have. Now, if you die without an estate plan, what happens? I mean, this is probably an area that is the most challenging for individuals. Um, again, going back to our uh, prior slides, if we talk about assets that were held jointly uh, as joint tenants of rights of survivorship, things like that, or there's designated beneficiaries like in an IRA or a retirement plan or life insurance, this is a great way to do some very simple estate planning. Simply joint ownership or designating beneficiaries. If it's not a retirement account, it could be what they call a TOD or transfer on death designation. Your bank can do this. Uh, you can do this on any investment or brokerage accounts and things along those lines. I wanna share with you though, just a quick story about a situation that uh, where I came across recently where an individual, um, in their 50s had a divorce and we were basically asking them to update their beneficiary designation since they were divorced now and it was official and they never got around to it and every year we were going through our reviews we say oh by the way you still haven't designated a beneficiary and you know they basically were like oh yeah i'll get back to you i'll get back to you uh, turns out they were not on good terms with their uh, brothers and sisters they had no children that individual during COVID did pass away. He was 58 years old. Um, sadly, the state stepped in because he did not have a will and he did not designate beneficiaries. So all of those assets got transferred to his brother and sister who he did not have a good relationship with. And frankly, he would have not wanted that money to go there. He probably would have wanted to go to a charity that he was in favor of, but again, his, his ultimate wishes would, were not followed uh, because he never wrote them down in an estate plan or indicated them on, as a beneficiary on either the retirement accounts or on hard assets like his home and things like that. Uh, generally in these situations, these assets pass, pass by the state intestacy laws. So as I was just describing, uh, his brother and sister were able to step in and receive those assets. Now, again, if you die without the estate plan, intestacy, what happens? Uh, each state is a little different on the rules as far as how this works, but the typical pattern of distribution generally follows the idea that if, an, if a husband and wife passed away, uh, one of them passed away, it generally, if they did not have a will or beneficiary designations, the assets would be split half with the wife and then uh, proportionately with the children, the final half. Um, most cases, 
the spouse would, the surviving spouse would want to inherit all of those assets because they still have to maintain their lifestyle. They still have to support the children, things like that. So again, it does create some issues here and your actual final wishes are never going to be honored by the estate. It goes by their laws on that particular state that you're living in. So again, some problems can occur in those situations. Uh, when you have a will, again, all assets within a will go through a probate process. Um, but the will itself is really, uh, as it's indicating on the slide here, the cornerstone of, the, of an estate plan. It shows how ultimately the properties would be distributed. Now, it does name an executor. Typically, this is a spouse or a trusted child or a friend. And also, they would also, if you had minor children, designate a guardian for them. Realize, if you don't have a will and you have assets that you leave behind that ultimately end up inherited by a minor child, the courts are going to designate a guardian. Whenever these situations arise, it equals a lot of fees that are going to be charged against an estate. I've seen them range anywhere from 10 to 20% of the estate being charged by uh, executors or appointed executors or guardians for the estate managing these affairs for these minor children. Some simple planning can avoid a lot of those costs. And again, uh, you want it to utilize to accomplish all your ultimate goals. And again, you're the one signing this will document and it's witnessed. So the courts will typically honor this unless there's some defective portion of it. But again, if you're using a good attorney, you should have no problems with any of this. Now, the probate process, a lot of people, you know, have a lot of opinions on this. And probate is not as scary as most people think. It could be if you have a simple estate, it could be maybe two, three month process with minimal fees and so on. If you have a more complicated estate, it can be a little bit more tedious and also more expensive. But the idea is, is that when someone does pass away, the, the will goes through probate. Uh, the will is uh, basically filed with the courts. The executor who is within the will, usually again, a spouse or a child, uh, or again, a trusted friend, basically, takes an inventory of all the assets. And at that point, they will also turn around, pay any final obligations, they will file any tax returns, and they will also ultimately, after everything is completed, distribute the assets to the heirs. Again, this process can take several months if it's simple, or up to a year, depending on the complexity of the estate. Now, the pros and cons ultimately, again, the pros, the costs are typically modest with most probate situations. Uh, it's court supervised. So again, we're following the laws of that particular state. Uh, it generally goes relatively smooth in that regard, assuming everything is in order with the will. Uh, you do get protection against creditors to some extent against the estate. Realize when uh, a, an individual passes and their uh, will goes into probate, there are notifications that are sent out to creditors that they must file a claim against the estate. If they don't do this during the probate process and the probate gets closed out, if the creditor tries to file after the fact, they typically will not be able to uh, you know, go against the estate and collect. So again, it does give you some creditor protection to some extent. The cons against it, obviously, as I was mentioning before, in a complex estate, it can be a little bit more time consuming. So those are some of the uh, issues there. Title transfers, again, could be delayed a little bit, depending on, again, the complexities and uh, some of the issues within the documents that have to be researched. Uh, there could be additional fees uh, for this purpose. Uh, realize if appraisals are needed on certain assets, things along those lines. Um, we also talk about ancillary probate. Remember when I mentioned earlier about an individual that maybe they were living in New York, they had all of their assets up here, but they owned a vacation home in Florida. Um, typically, they would have to file probate in New York and Florida. So again, talking about the fees, depending on the complexity of the estate, 
we can see that uh, being an issue, having to file probate in two states, you'd have to, you know, if the attorney that you're working with is not admitted in that state, you'd have to hire another attorney uh, to deal with it. So again, just some aspects to this you should be aware of. The other side of it is the probate process is a public process. When you file for probate with your will, generally it is a public record. So anyone can walk in after the fact and say, hmm, how was this estate adjudicated? Who received what assets? What were the assets worth? Things along those lines. So if privacy is a concern, that is definitely a negative with the probate process. Now, how can we avoid probate? Uh, there's a lots of ways that we can do this. Uh, generally, as I was mentioning before, if you take the assets and put the proper titling on there with joint tenants of rights of survivorship or TOD designations, for example, uh, or beneficiary designations on an account such as an IRA or retirement plan or life insurance, this all works. And it's again, extremely effective to avoid probate because those assets transfer directly to the beneficiary of that particular account or uh, in circumstance, if it's a trust, things along those lines. Now, again, using these types of uh, assets in a trust can also be beneficial because trusts will transfer assets immediately. You don't go through any public probate process and so on. And there's different types of trusts that can achieve this. And we'll talk about those in a minute. But again, using a trust is probably one of the more popular areas besides the beneficiary designations or joint tenants uh, with rights of survivorship. Uh, so again, understanding those rules and uh, determining if a trust can make sense for you might be the answer here. Um, and again, while you're alive, you can make gifts to individuals. And we're gonna talk about gifting in a minute, but uh, gifting is a good way within a family if you know you have assets that you're not utilizing, it may provide you with some tax benefits. Uh, and also, if you do make a gift to someone, you get to see them enjoy it. And that sometimes is uh, worth it versus waiting for you to pass away and then having the asset transfer over to them. Now, some of the basics here uh, we're going to talk about here is the federal gift tax uh, policy. So again, as I mentioned earlier, Every individual has uh, possibly, an, excuse me, with the federal estate tax code, you have an $11,700,000 exemption that you can elect upon death or during your lifetime when you want to make gifts in excess of certain amounts. And we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, the estate taxes on the transfers, again, either posed during your lifetime or death. And there's also the situation where we talk about federal generation skipping tax, which is essentially when you're leaving assets behind, not to your primary beneficiaries like a spouse or your immediate child, but maybe your grandchildren, things along those lines. And again, the, this applies either during your life or upon death. And we'll talk about that in a second. But again, you also may want to consider that your state that you live in may also have some tax implications upon death and so on that you may want to consider. Now, uh, gift taxing, uh, gift tax generally is probably one of the bigger concerns when people do make a, a transfer. Just so you know, in 2022, the exclusion for gift tax is that you can gift any individual up to $16,000 in 2022 so, and you will not be imposed on any, no gift tax will be imposed on that gift. And if you are a husband and wife, you can double the gift to that individual as a joint gift. So you could technically gift up to 32,000 without any taxes due on it. And it becomes pretty straightforward. Uh, again, as I was mentioning before, the 11,700,000 exclusion from all transfers for estate and gift taxes. And you know, lastly, again, uh, this we're at the highest level of this particular exclusion. Uh, realize back during the Obama administration, uh, one of the uh, exemptions that they did was they started to increase the estate tax uh, 
exclusion from 5 million and it incrementally went up over a period of years to 11 million 700,000. The unfortunate aspect to this is in 2025, there is a sunset provision that will revert back to a $5 million exemption. So again, understanding the value of your estate and what potential taxes would be due is extremely important in this situation. If you do have an estate that is over $5 million and you're younger, you may want to you really sit down with an attorney and really discuss the best option for you to minimize the impact of taxes on your estate, given that potential that the exclusion is only gonna be marked down to 5 million in 2025. Now, you know, again, talking about transfers on death, again, the estate taxes will apply, uh, but again, if it's going to a spouse or a charity, generally there are no taxes due at that time. And again, uh, during that time period when assets are being uh, transferred, you have still that $11,700,000 exclusion from these taxes. So again, these assets get excluded, they don't get taxed up to these numbers. And also uh, something new is you, if let's say you have two spouses that have a very large estate and they've only used a portion of the exemption uh, of the 11 million of the assets that they may have in their name and the other spouse may have more assets than the 11 million, you can transfer over those unused portions of the uh, assets uh, of the exemption to that surviving spouse for their estate when it ultimately uh, gets, uh, goes through disposition. Now, again, these new features with this exemption are out there. Again, it allows for that portability of the unused portion, as I just described. And again, that, that would ultimately give a family a $23,400,000 exemption from their estate. So tremendous numbers here. Most estates are not going to fall into this category. As a matter of fact, uh, the most net worth out there is this is dealing probably in the top two or 3% of the population. Most estates are below a million dollars. So a lot of this may not apply to you individually, but the concepts are potentially there. And it's not unusual for us to find an individual with a business and so on that has assets that are over $5 million. So understanding that and doing the proper planning upfront is extremely important. Now let's talk about generation skipping tax. Again, this is a situation where you designate beneficiaries that are next generation down from your immediate children, let's say. So you're looking at your grandchildren or beyond to make a gift. Again, the tax situation, this $11,700,000 number, again, this keeps coming up because this is all tied together. Again, you have an exemption up to that amount that you can exercise upon death. And again, most people will be more than covered by this exemption, even up to the 5 million. Again, most people would be fine and not have an issue. The only time you may potentially have an issue is if, you know, again, uh, the state tax drops down to around 5 million. And if you, again, have some assets that are in total over 5 million, then you may start to get into that area. Again, family businesses, things like that. There was a lot of consideration for family farms, which, you know, given real estate and things along those lines, you know, the idea was to, to preserve those assets for the next generation to continue those uh, businesses and so on. That's where this uh, allows that to happen. So very important. And again, you know, the exemptions, you know, it's unlike a gift, the exclusion, is again, not portable. So just understand that when it comes to the GST tax, that you cannot uh, you know, you, use the unused portion towards another beneficiary or something like that. So very important to understand the differences there. Now, this is uh, just a schedule of the basic tax code right now uh, that exists at the federal level. Uh, again, Starting in 2019, the exemption was 11,400,000. And as I mentioned earlier, it incrementally goes up. Currently it's at 11,700,000. Next year it goes up a little higher and so on. And then 2025 reverts back to 
the $5 million number. So again, understanding that is extremely important when you're starting to do your planning. Now, lifetime gifts are probably one of the areas where I find people get a lot of joy. I deal with a lot of older clientele that have children and grandchildren and so on. And again, they're looking at their life and saying, you know, I have assets here. I don't need these assets. I am going to transfer these, uh, you know, now while I'm alive, making cash gifts or gifts of uh, appreciated securities, things like that. And there are some benefits to this that I'll talk about in a second. But again, talking about a gift taxing strategy, in 2021, the exemption from gift taxes was 15000 In 2022, it's twenty excuse me, uh, 16,000. So just understand that, that you, it has gone up a little bit. And one of the other areas, if you're not gifting cash, is the use of, of gifting to transfer appreciated assets from your estate. So an example of this would be, let's say I own uh, a thousand shares of Apple stock and my original purchase price for those shares were $100 a share. I'm using some very basic examples here. Um, the stock itself has now appreciated to $400 a share. I've owned it for many years. So I have in that situation, while I'm alive, a $300 gain per share. So this becomes a potential issue if I wanted to go and sell this stock. But if I didn't anticipate that why I really wanted to sell the stock, I can transfer up to $16,000 of that stock to one of my beneficiaries or any individual I'd like. What it does is it moves that asset off of my balance sheet, which I may be at a higher tax rate, depending on the capital gain laws and so on. But when you start to think about who's inheriting the asset, realize your beneficiaries who are receiving this are going to receive the original cost basis. So in a sense, you've made a nice gift to those individuals, but they will have to pay some potential capital gains taxes on those assets if they sell them. And in my example, let's say the cost basis that I had was $100. I am now transferring that $100 cost basis over to whoever I'm gifting those shares to. And if they decide to sell it at the market, let's say it is $400, they will realize a $300 capital gain per share. Now, potentially, they would be in a lower tax bracket. I see this happening a lot with grandparents gifting uh, appreciated assets down to grandchildren. Realize a, a child is going to have a tax rate anywhere from maybe 10 to 15% versus an adult who may have other income and assets that they're dealing with, and they may have a tax rate of 20 to 25, 30%. Again, depending on their situation. So understanding the benefits of transferring these assets during your lifetime can also reduce your state while you're living and give assets to someone that is going to pay a lower tax rate on the appreciation and ultimately net a nice gift from you at the end of the day. Now, when we start to, again, talk about these transfers and exclusions I mentioned earlier, uh, Tax exclusion for 2022 is 16,000, and it's 32,000 if you are giving a joint gift with your spouse. Now, nice thing about that, again, you don't have to file any gift tax returns. And again, as long as you note on the check that you're giving to that individual, that this is a joint gift between the spouses, you're more than covered for tax purposes because when you get that check back uh, when it's canceled, uh, and they've cashed it, you have a, a record for if the IRS ever comes knocking on the door asking about this particular gift. Um, now, for individuals that are looking to gift into a 529 account, these are the college savings plans that typically have uh, a very nice uh, benefit that the money grows tax free for a qualified higher education or trade school. A parent or grandparent can gift up to $75,000 $75, individually, or again, jointly up to 150,000. And this is a tax-free gift. So just understand that it's a, it's a great benefit. Or conversely, let's say, you know, a child is uh, getting ready to go to college or even middle school or anything like that. A parent or, or grandparent ultimately is usually where we see this playing out. They can pay 
the tuition directly to that educational institution. And again, tax-free gift, uh, and it could be an unlimited amount. Uh, I recently had a client, uh, their, their grandchild got admitted to one of the Ivy League schools. For those of you that are not familiar with the cost of college education, an Ivy League school can range anywhere from around sixty to $80,000 a year. Uh, the grandparent basically was paying that tuition for that grandchild. And again, zero taxes due, uh, doesn't apply to any of the exemptions and so on. So it really is a nice way to handle that. And lastly, uh, that gifts that are not subject to taxation, if you are paying for someone's medical expenses, uh, let's say you have a child, a friend, whoever, and they're facing some extreme medical expenses, you can pay directly to that healthcare provider, whatever those bills are. And again, it is not taxable as a gift to that individual that you're helping out. So these are some really good ways of dealing with this. Now, talking about trusts earlier, again, um, this is probably one of the more flexible tools that we utilize. Again, I talked about a living trust before, and we're going to talk about some of the variations on that. Uh, again, in the event of incapacity, it avoids probate, it minimizes taxes. You can have professionals managing the assets within the trust. Uh, and again, if you have minors or elderly parents or other beneficiaries, again, you can structure certain safeguards around the trust that would protect those individuals and provide for their health, education, maintenance, and support. So these are some of the basic areas that are addressed within a trust document if you do have specific beneficiaries. Um, it also protects uh, the assets from creditors. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And again, overall control of the property. Now, uh, basically, what is a trust? A trust is a legal entity, uh, and basically it'll hold the assets. Uh, in this illustration here, the grantor is the individual that is transferring the asset into the trust. The trust is a document, but it will have, uh, depending on the type of trust, it could be a living trust or a testamentary trust. What that means is a living trust is created while you're alive. So again, as I was talking earlier, you can transfer assets into a trust uh, to manage them uh, for your benefit in the event of incapacity, things like that. Or you can have a testamentary trust, which basically means a trust is created upon your death. These are typically included in a will, and they would usually be for the uh, benefit of a minor child. But I have seen situations where Within a family, I, I was doing some planning with a client recently. They had three children. They were all adults in their 20s and 30s. Sadly, one of the children uh, has struggled with mental illness and addiction issues. Um, so a testamentary trust was created in the will document for that one child that basically when they were going to inherit the one third of the estate from the parents, the two other siblings were going to be the trustee and they were going to administer the assets for that individual's benefit for the rest of their life. Again, providing for their health maintenance, if they were going to school for their education or just general support needs. Uh, probably one of the worst situations I've seen is when they haven't, uh, an individual hasn't done that type of planning and the assets go to that individual that may have some mental or addiction issues, things along those lines. And they typically run through the money very quickly and then there's other problems. Uh, so again, understanding the testamentary versus living trust is, is probably extremely important. Uh, if there may potentially be a conflict between the siblings uh, that are going to potentially be the trustee for that beneficiary, that other child within the family, you can go out and appoint a corporate trustee who is a third party. They're not part of the family and they will follow the trust document to the letter and administer those assets again for the benefit of that individual. You are paying for this service. Uh, it is not free, obviously. Large banks sometimes will provide trustee services to manage these assets and administer them for the benefit of that individual. 
But again, just understanding there are options there. These are the items though that you typically would discuss with your attorney. Again, those family dynamics and issues, that all becomes very relevant in that conversation. And when we start to talk about the two basic types of trusts, one is a revocable trust and one is irrevocable. Now, a revocable trust typically is why you're alive. Um, I am, you know, it's a called the living trust. So essentially while I'm alive, I am gifting assets into a trust. It's called a revocable trust because I can go in and change the provisions as the grantor of the trust anytime I want. I can say, you know, I want these people to inherit the assets or down the road, I can change that things along those lines. But one of the things you have to realize is that when you pass away, that trust becomes irrevocable. Nothing can be changed thereafter and the assets will be distributed or administered according to that document. Now, you can also create an irrevocable trust while you are alive. We see this typically happening with life insurance situations where you want to have the death benefit exempt from inclusion in your estate. So again, uh, when we start talking about life insurance, uh, again, you, it provides an instant estate. Instant liquidity gets pushed into that individual's estate for the beneficiaries. So again, providing that liquidity that may be needed if there are debts to be paid, college educations to be funded, things along those lines, or ultimately estate taxes and things along those lines. Um, and the key issue is on the ownership of the policy. Now, if you own the policy individual and you pass away, so if I owned my own life insurance policy that let's say had a million dollar death benefit, if I pass away, that million dollar death benefit transfers to my beneficiaries, I don't pay any income taxes or the beneficiary doesn't pay any income taxes, but that million dollars gets put on top of my estate. So potentially if I had, let's say, let's say I had a $4 million estate, just as an example, and we're in the year 2026, and the estate tax exclusion basically uh, went down to the $5 million threshold. And I had a $4 million estate. In that situation, if I own the policy directly, that death benefit would get included in my estate. So now I'm right at that $5 million threshold to be taxed at the federal level for estate tax purposes. So it's important to understand how the life insurance is going to be disposed of. And again, taxed ultimately if included in the estate. By using an irrevocable life insurance trust, they call it an illit. Basically, I'm the insured and I'm, I'm gifting this policy. So as the insured, if I'm creating an irrevocable life insurance trust, I am ultimately going to be drop, naming the trust as the owner and the beneficiary of the policy. And technically the way this works is the trust purchases the life insurance and it's owned within the trust and the trust will ultimately indicate who the beneficiaries are and so on for that policy. Now, I am making gifts to the trust, paying the premium and ultimately, you know, for the trust to be valid, the beneficiaries can withdraw those cash gifts if they wanted to, usually within 30 days after the gift is made. Otherwise, the asset, the money remains in the trust and is paying the premium. This is called a crummy provision. It's based on some legal action that was a while ago that uh, was against the IRS. But ultimately, those provisions are usually within every trust. And again, uh, the trustees that ultimately is usually a spouse or one of the beneficiaries can use that money to pay the premiums. So it's important to understand the structure of this. It, it may look a little complicated here, but it really isn't. And it's probably the best way to handle life insurance in the event that you do have a large estate. Now, uh, talking about the mechanics here, the illit receives the proceeds of the life insurance policy. They're not subject to estate taxes and also they're not subject to income taxes. So it's important to understand that. And the proceeds are ultimately distributed uh, based on the terms of the trust 
you know, ultimately going to the beneficiaries, again, free from any estate taxes. So again, life insurance is probably one of the better vehicles here that someone can utilize to A, create the liquidity within the estate and to provide for those beneficiaries. If maybe, you know, potentially I have some clients that have, you know, very large real estate holdings, but they may not generate enough income for, to support the family. Life insurance can provide that liquidity and continue that income flow that may be missing in that equation. Again, everyone's situation is a little different. No estate plan is a one size fits all. So it's important to understand where these uh, situations can benefit you. Now, concluding all this, uh, you know, make sure that at a minimum you have implemented a plan for your incapacity. This is, you know, healthcare proxies, living wills, and powers of attorney. Uh, you know, those two, three basic documents really are uh, important alongside of the will. So understand it's usually a package of those four documents when you do speak with an attorney. Uh, I do recommend that if you are doing any estate planning, you can sit down with an individual like myself as a certified financial planner, but ultimately you will need to sit down with an attorney to draft the documents that are going to be valid for your needs. And that is probably the most important aspect of this that, you know, most people overlook. You can go to an online, uh, you know, will or trust document service. Uh, there's plenty of them out there. Uh, but again, you should ultimately, if you do uh, utilize something like that, have an attorney review it. Sometimes they will have attorneys on staff that you can pay a little extra. Um, you know, just understand that an attorney should be involved at some point in this conversation when you're designing your estate plan and ultimately wanting to benefit your family. Uh, realize. If your current estate plan does not reflect your ultimate wishes and circumstances, meaning if you don't have a plan or if you have one that's maybe out of date, uh, I come across a lot of people that prepared wills when their children were very young, maybe 20, 30 years prior. Now they're in a situation where there's grandchildren involved and so on. You know, again, understanding that these documents don't just sit in the top drawer waiting for you know your ultimate demise you should be reviewing these every few years or when there is a major change in the tax codes and again understanding that you want your ultimate wishes to be exercised upon your death by the executor or the trustees or ultimately the beneficiaries receiving these assets and that's where all of this becomes extremely important so again if if you have questions please reach out to me uh, I do want to thank you uh, for your time tonight. All the best to you. God bless. And uh, again, uh, thank you for joining us. I appreciate it.